Welcome back, everyone. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, we have a lot of things to go over, one of which is Disney just reported this week that they now have 73 million subscribers for Disney+. Plus. 73 million. The analysts did not expect this. Their consensus was 66 million. So they were off by a lot. They were off by over half. They thought that Disney was only going to gain about 6 million subscribers, and here they are gaining 13 million. This is huge for Disney. On this note, we also have an interview we're going to be looking at with Bernie McTurnan. He's an analyst for Disney. He has a buy rating on it. And I think he's been pretty spot on with everything that he said about the company. So we'll be taking a look at that as well. And then this week, we also had news that raised a few eyebrows. The Pfizer CEO, after announcing the amazing news, the positive news of a safe and effective vaccine for the coronavirus, he immediately sold off about 60% of his stock in Pfizer. So he announced this great news, and then he went and sold a lot of his stock in the company. Some people have said that's a little bit convenient of timing. Is this something we should be concerned about? Is this something that should be looked into and scrutinized? I'm going to give my thoughts on it on this episode and what this means for the Pfizer vaccine in general. And then on that same note of the vaccine, we had that great news of the vaccine on Monday. And then this week has been terrible news of rising coronavirus cases. The U.S. just reported 180,000 new cases in a single day. The coronavirus is spreading quickly. A lot of investors are concerned about this. They're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about a second round of shutdowns. I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on this and how I think investors should view it. And then, of course, we also have my portfolio. In this week of crazy news, I've been able to gain about $6,200 in value. So we're going to take a look at what is making these big gains in my portfolio over the previous week, because this is a pretty good week considering how the market has performed. So we'll take a look at that. We'll see what companies are performing really well. And we'll take a look at what companies I've been buying this week and which ones I'm going to be buying next week. So obviously, we got a lot to get into, a lot of things to talk about. We do have a Patreon that you can consider joining. There's a link in the description of this video. It gives you access to a community Discord. There's over a thousand active members, as well as a dividend tracking website that we're building from the ground up. We're releasing new features on it. We're currently working on building it in iOS and Android. So it'll be a phone app as well as a desktop website. We got exclusive episodes, in-depth research on different companies, and lots of different fun things to do. So you can try that out. It's risk-free. There's a link in the description. Okay, let's first jump into this big news of Disney's quarterly report. This is one of those companies that has a lot of things going on, good and bad at the same time. The good is that they have 73 million subscribers for their Disney Plus service. That far exceeds the analyst expectations. Um, This is something I've been saying for a while, that investors will look more to the streaming over time, and you're seeing that right now. This New York Times article says that streaming has taken center stage. The other parts of the company are not doing well right now. Disney on Thursday reported an 82% decline in quarterly operating income. 82% decline year over year. That's pretty bad. And in normal circumstances, you'd see a major sell-off in a company like that. But after Disney released this quarterly report, their stock price went up. It went up like four or 5% in a single day. So Disney reported 82% operating income loss, and then their stock price went up four or 5%. The reason why? Well, because of their streaming. Wall Street already decided that Disney's overall results for the quarter, the fourth in the company's fiscal year, would be apropos of nothing. Investors are confident that Disney's theme park will come roaring back when a vaccine is deployed. And all they really care about, at least for the moment, is streaming, streaming, streaming. I'm in that group as well. I'm one of those investors that, as of right now, I do not care about the theme park business. They can report terrible earnings with it. That's okay. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And in my mind, this pandemic is 100% a temporary phenomenon. It's not going to last forever. Disney's theme parks will come roaring back when we get over this pandemic. So when that happens, their business will become operational. That operating income that's down 82% for the year, it'll come roaring right back. I really believe that that will happen. And in the meantime, Disney's building up a streaming service that I think is invaluable. It's the modern way of distributing media content, and they have such a good lead in doing this. So I agree with other investors that are on board with this. What matters right now is the streaming, and Disney is killing it in streaming. The one thing that they're lacking right now at their streaming is a lot of new content. Bob Chapek said, quote, It's very clear to us that new content adds subscribers. He said that he was very pleased with its recent Premier Access experiment with Mulan. 
that was when they charged $30 on top of having a membership to be able to view Mulan. And that's a movie I think had mixed reviews. A lot of people really didn't like it, but he saw that as a success. He said, quote, we saw enough very positive results to know that we have something here in terms of the premier access strategy. This is not what movie theater chains want to hear, that Disney's figuring out other ways to distribute their content and still make a lot of money doing it. Movie theaters are in a lot of trouble. They need to still be relevant in a post-coronavirus world and the longer this drags on, the more companies like Disney figure out ways to function without them. So I think that movie theaters will be around, but they might not be as profitable as they once were because Disney and other big box office hit makers are figuring out other ways to make money. I think that Disney at the end of this year is going to put a huge emphasis on streaming. I think they're going to dedicate a lot more money to it. Now let's go to Bernie McTurnan. This is a Disney analyst. He's been following this stock for a long time. He currently has a buy rating on it, even with the recent jump up. So let's go ahead and see why he thinks this company's a buy. But the reason why the stock's reacting the way it is, is because of the sub number in 73 versus 73 million versus 66 million consensus, consensus estimate is huge. And the reason why the reason why we think you should own shares is because of streaming. He says the reason that he thinks he should own shares is because of streaming. I agree with him. That's the only real reason to own the stock right now. But he also says that the analysts were expecting 66 million subscribers reported, and instead they reported 73 million. So the analysts were way off on this prediction, way off by like 7 million subscribers. I'm on the other end of these predictions. I think that Disney is going to gain subscribers far faster than people expect. I thought that by the end of the year, they could have close to 100 million subscribers. That might be a little bit overly optimistic. If I was to re-gauge my predictions, I think that by the year end, they'll have 85 to 90 million subscribers, which is still phenomenal. Now Bernie's asked how much of this subscriber growth does he think is due to this pandemic? If we came out with a cure, we have a vaccine and we get over the coronavirus, is Disney still going to be able to grow their Disney Plus streaming service? Or is that going to slow down quite a bit? Well, what's interesting about Disney, if you compare it to Netflix, for example, Disney is still launching globally. So the launch in the rest of Western Europe certainly helped this quarter. In, in the December quarter, we're going to get help by the LADAM launch as long as la launching Disney Hotstar in Indonesia. So. Um, we're not, di or sorry, Disney's just not the point yet where um, they're fully penetrated. So I think this growth can continue. It's really interesting. The company had 120 million global subscribers at the end of the September quarter. That compares to Netflix at about 195 million. So obviously Netflix has a much uh, higher ARPU than, than Disney does at the moment on their streaming subscribers. But we think over time, Disney should have a more efficient spend on their content because of the brands because you know what you're getting. Um, and that's really a reason why we're so bullish on Disney. So he says, no, he doesn't think it's going to slow down if we get through the coronavirus. He thinks what's accelerating its growth right now is it's continuing to go and open up new markets. It's opening up in Europe and other places that Disney already has a strong brand name and presence. And on top of that, he mentions that Disney will likely have a much more efficient spend on content than Netflix. Because Netflix does not have the same brand value as Disney, Disney can come out with a few key series. They can come out with a few Marvel series, a few Star Wars series, and that's enough to keep people hooked to their service, while Netflix has to continually come out with hundreds of different series trying to appeal to everybody. So they have different strategies, but ultimately the thought here is that Disney is going to have a much more efficient spend on their content. Now, like a lot of companies, Disney's stock has been all over the place this year. If I go back to the past five years, you get an idea of how little this company has actually moved. It started at $120 a share back in November of 2015, and then it basically traded flat for the next four years. It didn't move at all. And then they announced their streaming service and it bumped up a little bit and then coronavirus happened and it went down quite a bit. So Disney stock has been all over the place, but for the past five years, this company has only gone up 15%. Think about that. The company Disney has only appreciated in value 15% in the past five years. Meanwhile, other companies have gone up tremendously over that same time period. So this is a company I've owned for a while. I owned it prior to the coronavirus. I was in the red for a while and then I continued to buy it during the March lows and I'm now back in the green on it. So Disney's a company I'll continue to own. It's the only company in my portfolio that doesn't pay a dividend. I could move it away from this portfolio and put it into like my retirement account or something because it's really not a dividend payer right now, but I don't want to get rid of the gains and returns of it. I want to keep it here. And I think that eventually there is a chance that this company will continue paying a dividend. Okay, now moving on, I want to talk about this news. This was the big news announced this Monday from Pfizer, in addition to a German company called BioNTech that developed the vaccine that they announced was 90% plus effective and it was safe. 
So we had a safe, effective vaccine. There was like 40,000 people in the trial that they've tested this on, and they called it a great day for science and humanity. So this was obviously super positive news, and the market reacted accordingly. A lot of the companies that have been damaged by the coronavirus have benefited from this news. And a lot of companies that have benefited from the coronavirus, their stock price was damaged because of this news. It disrupted the market a lot. And there's some people that have tried to explain that this news really isn't as positive as it seems. Let me go ahead and highlight one comment that I thought was pretty good on my previous video. This one's from Ant NFS. He says, no data from this trial has been openly published, peer-reviewed, or pre-printed. The sample and cursory findings have been provided in an optimistic headline with no explanation. The results were an enormous boost to the stock price, promptly followed by a convenient multi-million dollar share sale by executives of the exact same company that generated the increase in the first place. Expect to see many, many caveats to the vaccine news over the coming weeks and a prompt drop in the market. This is nowhere near as good as it sounds. If it were, there would be a greater degree of transparency. So Ant NFS here, this user saying, don't get too excited about this news. There's no degree of transparency here. It hasn't been peer reviewed. There's gonna be a lot of caveats that come out. It's nowhere as positive as it sounds. Plus the executive sold a lot of stock right after announcing it. And that's true. The Pfizer CEO sold a lot of stock after announcing this news, which is something that I thought was very convenient timing as well. I do think it should be investigated because he didn't sell before this news. He waited until this came out to sell. And I don't know all the different rules that these executives have to go by, but I do think this was so convenient that it should at least be investigated. But the lack of transparency in this announcement, the convenient stock sale by the executives, that wasn't the only thing that concerned some people. A lot of people also brought up that this vaccine has to be stored in a very, very cool fridge. The freezer in your kitchen likely gets down to temperatures around negative 20 degrees Celsius. That's negative four degrees Fahrenheit. Pfizer's promising COVID-19 vaccine, by contrast, must be stored at about negative 70 degrees Celsius, negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit. So people are pointing out that the refrigerators can't keep this thing cold enough. Those cold storage requirements are raising serious questions about who could get the Pfizer vaccine if approved and when. So this is another concern that people have brought up about the vaccine. They bring up that it hasn't been transparent, that the executives are selling shares in the same company that created the vaccine, and that it has to be stored in these incredibly sub-freezing temperatures. Now, I'll say I've noticed something common with people that are bringing up all of these concerns. There's usually a common theme that I've noticed on Twitter and elsewhere. A lot of them are tech investors. A lot of them have been investing in companies that benefit from coronavirus being around. So now they're looking at reasons why the vaccine is not going to work. They're trying to explain that this is going to go on for a longer amount of time. And some people seem to believe that we're never going to really get over the coronavirus, that there's never going to be a cure or a solution, that it's just going to be around forever. And that way their tech investments will benefit from it. I think that this is a huge mistake for any investor. It's true that right now we're seeing a ton of coronavirus cases. Just the last reported number in the United States was 180,000. That's an enormous amount of cases. But I argue with a certain degree of confidence that this is temporary. This is not going to be around forever. It does not matter if this Pfizer vaccine doesn't work out exactly how it's planned. It doesn't matter if we don't have the right amount of fridges to begin with, or if the CEO sold stock. Eventually, the coronavirus is going to be dealt with. If it's not with this Pfizer vaccine, it'll be with a different one. If it's not with the vaccine at all, it'll eventually run its course through society. The famed investor John Templeton is often quoted saying that the four most dangerous words in investing are, quote, this time it's different. Those are the four most dangerous words, this time it's different. And I see a lot of people saying those four words right now in regards to the coronavirus. I've been saying for a long time that the coronavirus is a temporary thing, that it will end eventually, society will move on, and it'll be something for the history books. And this isn't based off of ignorance or naivety or optimism. This is based off of looking at history. Every similar disease like the coronavirus eventually comes to an end. You can look at the Hong Kong flu, 1968 to 1970. It killed 1 million people. The Russian flu likewise lasted two years, killing 1 million people. We have the Asian flu, killing 1.1 million. We have Ebola from 2014 to 2016. It killed 11,000 people. The yellow fever in the late 1800s, that eventually came to an end. We have the swine flu, killed 200,000 people. It lasted about a year. We have the 18th century Great Plagues, that killed a lot of people, 600,000. The Japanese smallpox epidemic killed 1 million, so on and so forth. 
We have some really big ones. Smallpox killed 56 million people. This was a disease that happened in a time where we didn't have a good understanding of how they're transmitted and we had no real therapies for them. The common theme here is that these diseases, these pandemics come to an end eventually. The only thing that's really different in this one, in the coronavirus, is that we have a far greater understanding of how it spread, how to treat it, and how to develop vaccines that can ultimately fight it. So a lot of people that are arguing that the vaccine isn't really gonna work as intended, that it's gonna take longer, that might be true. There might be all these little things that happen, but one thing's for certain, this will eventually end and your investments should be invested accordingly. I do not believe that COVID is going to be around forever. We're very resourceful people. And I think the same advice here can be applied. The dangerous words in investing are this time it's different. I don't think with coronavirus, it's going to be different. So with that in mind, what do we do with our investments? I think, first of all, some people that believe that if the coronavirus is cured, their tech holdings are going to go down like crazy. I don't agree with that. I think a lot of the successful companies in tech that have been the beneficiaries of the coronavirus, I think they'll continue to do fine. A lot of these companies are making tremendous amounts of income. I don't own any of these companies on the basis that they're only going to be successful with a pandemic going on. I think all of them will continue to generate lots of profits and do really well, even if coronavirus was suddenly cured. There are some companies that I do think will do really well once we get over the coronavirus. Store Capital is one holding that I've been building up a lot. This is a REIT and it's benefited from this coronavirus vaccine news. I think that as we get over the coronavirus, eventually these type of holdings will benefit shareholders a lot. This company's gained about 15% in value in the past week, and it pays a hefty dividend. So this company has it all. It pays a hefty dividend, and I'm gaining capital gains at the same time. JP Morgan's another company that I think will do really well as we move past the coronavirus. As the coronavirus becomes a thing of the past and the economy starts to heal, this bank is going to appreciate in price as well as it will be able to issue more dividends. This is another pretty hefty dividend paying company. It pays over a 3% yield currently. If I filter by the past week, it's up 10% in just the past five days. So obviously good news with the vaccine helps out JP Morgan. Disney's another company that will benefit from a vaccine and the coronavirus being a thing of the past because they can open back up their parks and their operating income will return. They'll be able to reinstate their dividend if they choose to. They can do a lot of things with their parks back open. But in the meantime, with things closed down, it also spurs their streaming growth. So I think Disney's in a win-win. If things stay closed, their streaming company will do good. If things open back up, their parks business will do good. So this company, in my opinion, is in a good position. The other two companies that I've been buying over the previous week, and I'm going to continue buying in the future, are both Costco and Home Depot. These are not steals. They're not big value plays. They're not trading at a deep discount. I can't find a time when Costco's trading at a discount. I've tried over the past three years and I just don't see it happen. Costco never really goes down in price. It has a lower beta than the general market, than the S&P 500. It rarely moves in price in a negative direction. So I'm just going to bite the bullet and continue buying Costco even at the premium. And in my opinion, Costco and Home Depot form the holy grail of physical retail. I think they're the two best retailers in the world outside of Amazon. And I don't think that Amazon can compete with either of these companies. So I'm gonna build up both my holdings in Home Depot and Costco. I know I'm paying a premium, but I'm not trying to time the market here. I really like these two companies. So I'm gonna dollar cost average into them over the next month. So overall, we're up $20,000 in gains. That's pretty good gains considering what's happened over the past couple years. And a quarter of that, one fourth of those gains is dividends. I've earned nearly $5,000 in dividends since the beginning of this portfolio. And that's a decent amount. In the past quarter, which is the past 90 days, we've earned $909 in dividends. So they continue to roll in hundreds of dollars a month. And I'm continuing to increase that over time as I build up these core holdings. Okay, let's move on and get to some emails. The email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. That's joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. You can email in any question you have or subject you want to talk about, and we can talk about it on the show. The first one's from Fabio. He says, hello. So I started investing in stocks and ETFs, and I'm wondering, should I use AutoInvest or make my own reinvestment choices? I would love to have an opinion from you. Well, Fabio, for this question, I think it depends. I would normally have AutoInvest on unless you have a specific reason you want to buy a company at a specific point in time. So if you have some type of thesis on a company that you think the pandemic might be over by the end of 2021, and so you're gonna buy these companies as a recovery play during that time, 
then you might want to direct money into those specific holdings. But on the other hand, if you just picked out a bunch of companies you like, that you're in it for the long term, you don't have any specific investment thesis for them other than their companies you want to own, I would just flip on auto invest. So I think it depends on the situation. If you have a specific reason for buying a company at a specific time point, I would definitely do it as individual buys. But other than that, I think auto invest is fine. Fernando says, hello, Joseph. I just wanted to let you know that I've been watching your show since episode 31. Keep up the great job and explaining stocks and providing excellent excellent investment content. I appreciate that, Fernando. I personally do not own any individual stocks because I prefer index funds. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, Fernando. Index funds are pretty amazing. I prefer to be hands off my investments and not have to do any analysis on each company or following the news, which I admire you for. I have a couple of questions that I would like your opinion on. One, in my 401k, I made $800 in a period of five years due to being over diversified. I had about 25 mutual funds. Yeah, that is a lot of mutual funds. 25? That's about as many individual stocks as you need to be diversified. With 25 mutual funds, that's a significant amount of overlap. You probably owned a lot of the same companies in each of those. You say, almost two years ago, I changed all my investments, 100% of it to the S&P 500, the only index in my company. Since then, I've seen my investment growth by 28K. I was wondering, what is your opinion on holding one index fund? I'm asking because my friends tell me not to put all my eggs in one basket, but I feel like the S&P 500 were to go down to zero, then everyone in the investment world would be in the same boat. I do have a stomach for risk and do not panic when the market goes down. Instead, I buy more. I don't understand this, Fernando. You're saying that you're investing in the S&P 500, and then your friends are saying that's not good enough, that you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. Do they understand the S&P 500 is 500 companies in the United States? It's a market cap weighting of the 500 biggest companies. That's not all your eggs in one basket. That is a huge amount of companies. That's a lot of different baskets. That diversifies you across different sectors, different companies that have different risk factors. The S&P 500 is heavily diversified. The biggest argument I think you can make against just having the S&P 500 is one, a lot of the weighting, like 20 to 25%, is just on the big tech companies. Some people think that that's too much of a weighting on those companies. I think it's pretty justified considering how much money those companies make, how much they control our lives. We're talking about companies like Facebook and Apple and Amazon and Google. Those are giant companies for a reason. So I do not agree with your friends at all. If you hold the S&P 500, you're pretty diversified. Another argument you could make against it would be if you hold the S&P 500, you're just holding companies in the United States. So if you want to get exposure outside of the United States, if you think that there's going to be growth in Europe or Canada or China or Japan and you want exposure to that, then you'd have to buy another index fund to give you exposure to those markets. In my opinion, I think that some portfolios have way too much weighting on foreign markets and emerging markets. Wealthfront, for instance, puts a lot of their money into these emerging markets. And I don't agree with that. I've never seen them perform as well as developed nations. I don't think that they have a lot less risk. So in my opinion, I think it's fine sticking with the US and Europe and maybe having a little bit exposure to China. But there's a lot of concerns with that as well. So the S&P 500 is fine. You are well diversified with it. I would feel fine putting my whole life savings just into the S&P 500. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's exactly what Warren Buffett recommends. So if he's recommending it to people openly, it can't be that bad of an investment decision. Now, part two, you say, my second question is about mortgage payoff early. My wife and I are debt-free except for the house. We have our emergency fund and even a crisis fund in place for uncertainty. Thankfully, we have not been affected by COVID since we work in the medical field. I do give an extra small principal payment every month, and the rest we started to invest in large growth index funds. You mentioned that in an episode, you'll be paying off your mortgage early. Congratulations, I'm happy for you. My question is, why did you decide to pay off your mortgage instead of investing? I read so many things online where people say it's better to pay off the mortgage. Some say investing and some say it's better to do both. What is your opinion on the matter? Thank you once again for your excellent show and hope you and your loved ones are doing well during these hard times. Okay, for your second question, Fernando, should you pay off your home early or should you invest? This is the, the battle that's been going on from financial nerds for a thousand years. There's people on one side of it saying that you should pay off the home. There's people saying you should invest. And this, again, is a battle that's been waged. People have different good points on both sides. I would say this. I wouldn't get too hung up over this decision because either way, I think you're doing a good thing. Either way, you're advancing yourself financially. But in most cases, 
I would at least commit some of your income to investments before paying your mortgage off early. I would commit 10 to 15% of your income to investments. And then anything beyond that, I would pay off your home. Even Dave Ramsey, who is the big no debt guy, never having a credit card, never using debt in really any way, he still recommends contributing to your retirement account, contributing to your investments before paying in advance on your mortgage. So even the guy that's probably the most notable for being against debt still says to invest before paying off your mortgage. In my situation, I haven't chosen to pay off my mortgage instead of investing. I'm investing like crazy. I put thousands of dollars into my portfolio every single month and I make that a huge priority. And then I take any extra money I have from doing contract work with programming, from doing YouTube, from doing my job. I take that extra money and I try to pay down my mortgage. So I'm definitely doing both. If I did not have the money to do both, I would contribute to investing before paying an advance on your mortgage. Ethan says, hi, Joseph, forget Disney Plus or HBO Max. I personally think your show is one of the best forms of entertainment and education out there. Well, I really appreciate that, Ethan. I've been following you since episode one, and your commentary has been very insightful and valuable. So thank you for all the good content. I'm a simple three fund bogglehead portfolio guy the total bond market, the total stock market, and international stocks. I wanted to ask you to speak about taxes, both from a portfolio standpoint as well as practical. One of the biggest hurdles of building wealth is taxes. This is why some investors care less about dividends than for growth, although oftentimes they do go together. Do you take taxes into account when you decide to buy or sell? I noticed, for example, that you'd probably be able to offset some gains by having sold losers this year like Boeing. Well, Ethan, you're absolutely right. If you sell a company at a loss, like I did with Boeing and NRZ, I sold out of a couple companies this year and moved that money into other companies I think are similar. You take the losses from those companies and those are realized losses, and then you can use that to offset your gains in capital gains. So I don't have to pay as much taxes on my dividends or my capital gains if I sold companies like Boeing or NRC. So that absolutely works to your advantage. What I would say is I wouldn't focus too much on taxes when you're making buy and sell decisions. You can consider it as part of it, but I would not sell a company specifically for taxes. I would sell a company because you no longer want to be invested in it. You don't think it has a bright future. I didn't sell Boeing just because I wanted to realize some losses and offset my taxes. I sold Boeing because I wanted to put that money into waste management and to Union Pacific, companies that I thought were more stable and would continue to pay dividends and didn't have so many uh, problems with the internals of their company. So that's the reason that I sold Boeing, but it also has the benefit of reducing my taxes by having a realized loss. So that's my opinion on that. I think that you should consider taxes, but I would not make it the biggest reason you buy or sell a company. And in regards to dividends, you do pay taxes on them, but if you hold the companies long enough, they're usually taxed at long-term capital gains rate, which is only 15%, which in my book is not that bad of a taxation rate. So hopefully that stays. There's talk with a Joe Biden presidency that that will change. So we'll see what happens. But right now, dividends aren't taxed too bad. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode there. I appreciate all of you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, sharing it with your friends and and whoever you think could benefit from it. So I appreciate all of you spreading it through word of mouth. And I'll talk to you guys next time.